Um, these are very distractive, but they don't really play much of a part. These are the results of a fire in the 16th century. There were holes burned in the shroud, and then some nuns sewed in these patches. So the images that we're concerned with here are in between these things here. I see. Now there you can see the front of the man and the back of the man. So this is what you see on the surface of the cloth. All right, now Bob, we have a second set here, which is rather interesting, which I think shows the image more clearly. And this is the result, I understand, of a photograph that was taken back in the 19th century. Well, actually, these photographs were taken in 1933, but the same thing happened in, in 1898. And this is why we're in interested in this. Up until uh, 1898, all anybody saw was uh, this kind of a stick-like character. But then, when they took the first photographs and they looked in the negative of the photograph, you suddenly saw this man and he was much more lifelike, much more positive appearing. Here we have the head. Right. And here's the thorax chest with the arms crossed across the pelvic region and the legs, right? Right. Now, I think it would be interesting to show our audience a close-up of the head. You brought one along. We, we, we're going to try to give you an image of this. It's a, it's a little difficult to see, but I think you'll be able to get the impression of it. There we see a close-up of the image that appears on the cloth in negative fashion, which has become the, the positive now because of the film that we've taken, right? This is the image that you see in a photographer's negative, uh -huh. not on the cloth, because we... This man now, is, his eyes are closed. He looks like he's dead. I mean, that's the point. All right, now let's, let's talk a little more about the shroud itself and, and the history of the shroud a little before we get into the, 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 your book and how you have come to certain conclusions. What exactly was the shroud? Well, the shroud can be traced back through documents to 1354. That's when it first surfaced, and we know it existed until that time. Uh, um, um, back to that time. We can prove it without a doubt. It surfaced in the church, in the, in the possession of a knight, a crusader. He said it was the burial cloth of Christ. He did not say where he got it. Uh, a circumstantial case for its existence all the way back to 2,000 years ago can be made, but it is not the unbroken line of documents back to 1354. All right, now the shroud, presumably, and according to tradition and according to some evidence, was the burial cloth, the linen, that the body of Christ was laid in after he was crucified. Is that right? Right. I, it is the linen that he was laid in when he was put in the tomb. Now, how large is that particular piece of linen? It's 14 foot long, three and a half feet wide. All right, now I think we have a picture that helps to show that that linen is actually a very large piece of cloth. It is. And here we see people holding the, uh, the shroud itself, and you have a very good picture of how the two images are really head to head. Yes, this was taken in 1933 at the exposition that they had. The shroud is not taken out uh, every day. It's only taken out every few uh, decades. This was 1933. The next exposition was not till 40 years later, 1973. All right, now we need to understand exactly how the shroud works in terms of the body relationship. It's wrapped around in a particular way. In other words, the two images are head on head, and the reason for that is shown in this photograph. The shroud was wrapped uh, head to toe and back again, not circularly like in a, on a mummy. Right. And that shows it clearly. If you were to open that cloth up like we just saw, you have the frontal impression and the back impression, which would be head to head. And there's a space between the two heads, too. All right, now, let's talk a little bit about the crucifixion and why the evidence of what was peculiar about the crucifixion and why that evidence seems to indicate that this was an authentic piece of, of linen in which the body were laid. Uh, one thing that I think we can point out, of course, we know that the crucifixion involved a crown of thorns. Is that not right? Mm -hmm. And doesn't this point out there's some blood stains here at the head? Yes. Uh, the interesting thing about this is the traditional picture of the crown of thorns of Christ that we always see in art is a little wreathlet. This man, however, had a cap of thorns on his head, completely covering the whole head. That is against all known tradition that we have of the pictures of Jesus, but it's, it is the way that if you were to, cr to crown an Eastern person with a miter, it would be a crown, because a miter is a crown. So that's a little piece of authenticity that uh, seems to suggest that uh, it's authentic. What about the, the, the wound in the side? We know that, uh, that Jesus supposedly was, was dispatched by a sword wound or a spear wound in the side. Does that show up on the... Yes, uh, next to the patch wound, I think you can... Uh, here. 
Uh, no, on the other side, and actually it's better on this one here. Why don't you show uh, us? We can Here's see it. Where's my pointer? Uh, right there is the wound, and you can see it clearly there. It's a two-inch gash right up there. It's been measured by anatomist, and that's blood that came out of it. The interesting thing about this is wherever the body here has been bruised and it's been whipped and beaten in the face, you can see swelling. Pathologists can't. Can. That's, why, that, that, that's the way that a live body reacts. It swells. But in this one here, there is no swelling. And of course, the New Testament says that the only wound that he received after death was this one. Now, of course, another aspect of that was the fact that uh, traditionally, uh, people died on the cross in, in a crucifixion from asphyxiation. And one of the ways that occurred was that they broke the legs of the yes. person so they couldn't support their body weight. And therefore, the body weight caused them to, right. to, to die of asphyxiation. And of course, we see here, there is no broken legs. No broken legs, and the thorax is very it distended as if the man was trying to get a breath. Uh-huh. All right, well, now let's take it a step further. Another thing that's very interesting has to do with the, the wounds in the hands. Uh, people who receive stigmata are always talking about having blood stains appear in the palms of their hands, but that wasn't really the way in which a body was crucified, was it? No, uh, Pierre Barbet was a Paris surgeon. He uh, crucified a body. He had access to them, and when he put the nails here, the weight of the body broke broke the nails through there. Uh, however, if you put a nail here, there's a, uh, a bunch of bones that form a little hole like, and a nail will slip through there without breaking any of them and make it's, it's held like a vice, and that will hold your body weight. So we have a picture now, I think, to show that there is a wound. This is taken from the, uh, from the shroud, and there is a wound in the wrist where normally a person would be crucified. Right, with a, um, that is a normal way to crucify, uh, not in the palms. And you see the blood stain there. Right. And the hands, are faintly outlined, the hands. Could I say something about the stain? Surely. Uh, uh, this stain here really shows an anatomical detail which is very convincing to pathologists. All of the blood stains show this, but this one very well. Uh, it shows a separation of serum and cellular mass. Now, when you cut yourself, you have a scabby thing form and it separates into serum and cellular mass that is a, a hard scab and then a serous fluid around it well that stain right there in the middle you can see that the hard red uh, scabby material and around the sides of it a much lesser pinker uh, material which is the serous fluid which is the way that real blood behaves when it's clotted all right now we've made a pretty good case that there was a body that evidently was wrapped in a piece of linen uh, what evidence have you come across in your, and what do you report in your book that, that gives some credence to the theory that that body was actually the body of Christ? Well, uh, if you accept that it is a body, and as I said, pathologists show that it is a body, then you've got to contend with the fact that this body was crowned with thorns, stabbed but, in the side. But why couldn't somebody, if they wanted to create a hoax, as has been suggested, do the same thing with uh, uh, another body and wrap it into in the uh, in the cloth? Well, he would be if he would be trying to fool somebody, right? right? And I think he would have gone along with the traditions that we always see of Jesus. He would have used a little wreathlet. Uh, he would have put the nails here. Uh, he would not have made the man naked. Uh, I only know of one picture in traditional Christian art which shows Jesus naked. Only one. I think he might have gotten burned at the stake for trying to do that. Also, why would he have done it in the negative? Because remember, this is the picture we see on the cloth. He would have made a negative image here which is very bad and which people don't believe is any good and would have had to have waited 500 years, obviously way after his death, before anybody could have recognized that it was worth something. All right, the next really burning question that has to be asked is how did this image appear on the cloth? Well, the, the truth is we don't know. It's absolutely unexplainable. I've been around the world trying to figure it out. What's your suggestion, though, in your book? Okay, I believe that it was formed by a flash of heat or light. Why? Uh, I'm one of three persons in the United States who's ever seen the thing. And as I stood there in 1973 and looked at it with the other experts, we were amazed at how much this light tan image looked like some of the scorch marks here. Now, that's a piece of physical evidence. It looked like a scorch mark, like the kind of thing you would get if you were put to put a, uh, a white sheet down and, and touch a, a hot iron on it. A subtle scorch there. Well, if I can't figure out how it was made, then I would say we have this story of Jesus, a resurrection, it was said. I don't think that's so beyond the possibility that something happened to this body to give off some heat, and that's how we got this negative image, which is a photographic thing, and again, scorch involves heat and light. Light connects with the photographic aspect, which is what this is. This is a photographic phenomenon. Are you suggesting that this is evidence then to support the theory of resurrection? 
Uh, yes, absolutely I'm suggesting that, absolutely. What happened to the old theory that has been used in the past concerning the shroud, that when Jesus was taken from the cross, of course there was some hurry to get him into the tomb before the beginning of the Sabbath, and also happened to be Passover, and there was a, a Judaic law that, he, that no one could be crucified during that time. And so they had no time to wash the body, and they simply sprinkled aloe, which was a form of preser preservative, an herb, on the body, and wrapped the body in the linen, and there was a combination of aloe and death sweat that also can produce a stain in this kind of linen. Well, that was uh, actually done in a laboratory. Somebody did produce a negative. The problem with it is that there are certain aspects of the face, for instance, the recesses of the eyes, the sides of the nose, which would not have appeared in a direct contact. If you're going to make a direct contact of the nose, if you've got to press the, film, the, uh, the shroud down around it, and then when you open it up like this is, you're going to have a nose out to here. So we have to find out, we have to uh, present a theory as to how those recessed areas down here, in between the legs, et cetera, got on there. And what was said was that ammonia vapors, which would have formed out of the sweat on the man, would have traveled straight lines and etched this very magnificent face in terms of artistic value in it. Well. That was accepted somewhat, but today any chemist will argue with that. They will say you can't, uh, ammonia vapors won't travel in straight lines. However, um, things like uh, um, uh, a, uh, a radiation from heat would. So you're really suggesting, in a way, a miraculous appearance of this image. You're suggesting no, a, a not miraculous. Well, no. what would cause the heat suddenly to cause this kind okay. of searing? Okay. Uh, in my book, I talk about Kirlian photography. Kirlian photography is a phenomenon where they've taken photographs in a special process, and you seem to have an aura around you. This has been given so much credence that it was on the front page of the New York, uh, the front cover of the New York Academy of Sciences, because they're going to use it as a diagnostic tool. Well, uh, if we have this aura around us, that is the kind, it's, that's the kind of aura, uh, I believe it's, uh, I don't want to say infrared, but a certain radiation, which we all know we have in our body. After all, um, uh, for breast cancer, they take what, uh, a heat photograph. That's where that could have come from, and that's, that's within science. Do you think, then how does that relate to the fact that you feel this would also suggest and, and help to, to uh, support the theory of resurrection, if it's just a purely natural cause? Well, um, who is to say that if you were a caveman 2,000 years ago and you said, I'm going to show your picture on that TV screen, would I believe it? No, I'd say it can't be done. Well, uh, this is the same sort of thing. In 2,000 years, we all may know how to dematerialize our bodies. When we split an atom, what we're doing is changing matter into energy. It breaks it down. Uh, Einstein said matter is energy, and all that, that's all that happened in that cloth. Did you set out to prove this theory? or I did not. I, I set out to disprove it. I went all over the world trying to find something like it and couldn't do it. And as a result, you proved it to yourself. Are you now a, are you now a better Christian? Were you a religious man before? Or? No, I wasn't a religious man before. I, uh, I've always been in awe of Jesus. Uh, he was a great man, the greatest in the earth, in, 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 in my opinion. Uh, I do not, however, say you have to believe that. Uh, he taught what all the great religions have taught. and. Uh, I think as long as you live like the Bible says, like the Old Testament or New Testament, you're going to be just as good shape as I am. I want to thank you very much for coming and talking about this unusual book and this unusual theory, and I think thank it's uh, something that's going to be debated for a long time yet to come. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Bob. Thank you. much aware of President Carter's human rights campaign.